You're listening to the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse at bellydancegeek.com. Hello, everybody. I'm Nadira Jamal, and welcome to episode 61 of the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse. The Clubhouse is a place where you can get together and geek out on all of those things that are hard to get in classes and on DVDs. If you want help with the what, things like moves and combinations and choreography, there are a lot of resources available to you. But if you want help with the why and the how, business, composition, ethics, culture, musicality, all of that can be a little bit harder to find. So every month I interview a different guest expert on a different geeky topic, and we always have time for question and answer so you can geek out too. So if you think that knowledge and creativity go together like chocolate and peanut butter, you are in the right place. My guest tonight is Zahra Zuhair, an international performer, workshop instructor, and choreographer. Zahra is world-renowned for her knowledge, authenticity, and dedication to the art of Middle Eastern dance. Raised in Rock Sharky from a young age, Zahra is known for her musicality and elegant style, and she's trained and influenced many of today's international stars. She began a specialization in Egyptian dance with her first study tour to Egypt in 1979, studying with Cairo's top teachers. Zahra's had the good fortune to see firsthand four decades of the great dancers of Egypt. She's continued her study and love of Egyptian dance and conducts study tours to Egypt as well as Morocco and Turkey. She's also the artistic director of the Gazella Dance Company and has written, directed, and choreographed theater productions intertwining Middle Eastern stories and dance under the name Ponana Dance Theater, loosely meaning a blend of many things since 1997. Her productions include Leila and Majnun, The Veils of Inanna, Caravan of Secrets, Tapestry, and Journey in Search of the Divine. Los Angeles, California has been Zahra's home base since 1984, where she's been one of LA's most esteemed teachers for many years. Her always evolving style keeps students, old and new, coming back for more. And you can check her out at ZahraZuhair.com. That's Z-A-H-R-A-Z-U-H-A-I-R.com. And you can also find her on Clubhouse episode number 44, The Power of the Positive Dancer. So welcome back to the show, Zahra. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So today, Zahra is going to be talking about letting the genie out of the bottle and how to find your own creative path. But before we jump in, why don't you tell us about your origin story? How did you get started in Oriental dance? Uh, Well, um, as a kid, I... um... I loved music and dance and uh, any kind of art, really. I loved to paint and draw, and I loved fashion and anything creative, especially dance. And I uh, started studying Oriental dance in the early 1970s. Um, Belly dance was uh, extremely popular um, in America at that time, and it was a phenomenon, like, uh, specifically in America. It wasn't such a global big sensation like it is now um it was just just a gigantic fad and uh, it was actually my mom's idea to take classes and but then I'm the one that got hooked and uh it became a lifelong career all right and how did you get interested in creativity as a practice well i guess just from being um uh, a professional dancer for so many years and and uh all around artist and creative person um i would go through times of being so inspired and just feeling like i was on fire with create creative ideas and then all of a sudden uh there would be nothing it would it would just be so hard to find inspiration and i would really have to work hard at it And um, along the way, I've had many uh, other dancers tell me the same thing, and a lot of students have told me the same thing. And they just start to think that they're getting burned out, and they feel like they're ready to quit, or they think there's something wrong with them. So this really got me thinking about it, and um, what are some of the things that uh, contribute to creative blocks, and what can be some of the solutions Right. Well, why don't we start there? So what is a creative block? Well, it's kind of hard to pin down because it's such an abstract notion as to why they occur, but in, and everybody's story is different. But in general, it, it's a period of time when an artist can't um, access their 
inspiration or can't bring themselves to create new work. So, and how can you tell if you're having one? Like, what, what symptoms should you be looking for? Well, it can feel like you're, as we call it, just in a rut. Uh, like you're not um, growing creatively and you're dancing or you just can't come up with any new ideas, like you're stuck. Uh, it's kind of like called the thrill is gone kind of feeling. Um, and uh, so many people have that at different times, and they think, well, really, what's what's wrong? What's happening here? But that can that can be a creative block. Um, just feeling like you're in a rut and you can't come up. You just feel like you're not going anywhere, and you ha- don't even know what direction to turn in. Um, and, the, you know, it, you just have to try to figure out what's happening there. You know, so, so many people think, what is, what's happening? What's wrong with me? I used to have good ideas. I used to, you know, uh, be more enthusiastic or uh, feel more inspired. But that that's very much uh, part of uh, having creative block. Mm-hmm. Now, I think I've had, you know, two different types of experiences that I both describe as a block. And one is kind of a, like, like an empty feeling, like nothing's exciting to you anymore. And the other one is, if you don't want me getting a little <laughs> rude, is it's, it's almost like constipation where you feel like there's so much inside, but nothing will come out. Um, do you feel like those are two different things or are they different manifestations of the same phenomenon? I think there's actually different kinds of creative blocks. Uh, I, I think there's lots of different kinds for different reasons. Um, there's what I call, I think what you're thinking of, like like what I call of a mental block. Uh, it's just like a blank page. like uh, uh, Or like you just feel like you're stuck in your own head. And um, it's hard to think differently. Or, or maybe, you know, a certain way you've been doing things has always worked for you, and then that's just not working anymore. And you just feel like, where do I turn? I'm just blank. That's, I, I, call, I think that's what I would call a mental block. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really hard to put your finger on it. And then I think there can be like... Um, uh, the type of block that's more like an emotional barrier, like uh, a person may feel like their ideas just aren't good enough. They're blocked because maybe there's something inside them that they feel like maybe their dancing doesn't measure up. or um, And it could be from anything. It could be from criticisms or they've heard unkind remarks or, uh, or a fear of being criticized. Sometimes we create phantoms in our head. Um, you know, because feel, feelings of inadequacy, and it can just be something that happens all of a sudden for who knows why, but uh, that can, can cause huge creative blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, other crimes can be uh, blocked because maybe a person has, uh, maybe it's poor time management or poor work habits. I, I think sometimes the way people are trying to work isn't compatible with their creative process. Uh, Maybe they're trying to work too early or too late or or they're they're not giving it enough time or there's too many distractions around and they can't stay focused and they're constantly distracted by going back and forth. I I should uh, answer these emails now and then they're trying to go back to work and be creative. And that doesn't work. It, it doesn't work for most people. Maybe some people can do that. Um, but there there definitely are different kinds. And, and everybody's different, and they can be for different reasons. Or it can even be a combination of all those things. And what are some of the consequences of letting these blocks you know, go untreated? Uh, my experience with, with other dancers talking to me about this is they really start to think they're burned out or start to have the feeling of that they're getting burned out. And I think they start, to, it, can, it can be very discouraging. And um, I think it can be mistaken for just being like, is, is that it? Is that all? Uh, have I said everything that I want to say in the dance? Am I just kind of 
washed up? Is is all my creativity gone? And it's it's uh, it can be very discouraging, and it can cause somebody to just like start getting burned out or or just feel like they want to quit. I really think it it you know uh, letting it go on too long it can really have uh, very unfortunate consequences when. Um, there's people that are very talented that I've seen that have just quit because they feel like, oh, I'm just, you know, I guess I'm just finished, you know. I just don't have good ideas anymore. And that's sad. It happens to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so next I'd like to dig into, you know, some of the reasons why we have creative blocks. And you've already touched on a few, but, you know, one thing that strikes me is that when we're kids, creativity is like effortless, right? You hand a kid a crayon and they're making something. You hand my nephew a wooden spoon and he's making music. Why is it so easy when we're kids and so hard as adults? I think uh, creativity is so easy for kids because they have the luxury. Their mind is free and they have the luxury of not knowing what isn't possible. For them, everything is possible. Uh, when you're a child, you're uh, you're praised by your parents and teachers for any imaginative story we come up with, or we can make any kind of crazy artwork, and we're praised for it. And put it, they put it on the wall at school, or everything goes on the refrigerator at home, and. Um, we hear stories of magic and make believe. So everything's possible. Everything's the the world is our oyster. I mean, there's you know you can and we're free as a child. You can just twirl down the aisle in the grocery store in your twirly dress and make silly faces and hop around and be silly and everybody thinks you're adorable. You can't do that when you're an adult because they think you're a lunatic. You know, and and as we get older, we begin to see everything is impossible. You know, we're we have to fit into society. We have to act a certain way, and we have rules and regulations and laws. And we begin to experience all kinds of things like rejection and uh, failures and whatever else life throws at us. And that's just the way it is. I mean, we can't go through life thinking we're the center of the universe. Um, but we also don't want to hang on to all that bad baggage we've collected along the way. You know, we need to learn to move from it, uh, move on from it and learn from it. Um, but that's a lot easier said than done. And I think um, as adults, we do uh, collect a lot of baggage. And sometimes we hold on to that. And sometimes we start collecting, we, we, we just, you know, along the way things happen and you don't even know that you're holding on to something. And that can just definitely get in the way. Mm-hmm. It can be a lot of things. Right. So, you know, thinking about some examples, what are some of the internal or external forces that contribute to creative blocks that we should be watching out for? Well, internal forces is what we were talking about, the baggage we've hung on to along the way. And then we, I think we, we develop these ideas about ourselves that may not be so positive. Um, you know, maybe some low self-esteem or some ideas about, uh, oh, we're not pretty enough, we're not good enough, we're not skinny enough, whatever it may be, um, all those you know, things society puts on, especially women. Um, You know, I think it's just so easy to hang on to those kind of things um, uh, internally. Um, And it's hard to let go of it. And externally, uh, the forces can be uh, your environment, too many distractions, it's just not inspiring or maybe a negative work environment, being surrounded by negative people uh, or people that are unsupportive around you or um, social media is is another external force. Um, Would you like to talk more about how that plays out? Sure. 
social media, I think uh, in general, so, social media is, is great for obviously certain um, things, uh, but I think it can be a big distraction from the main creative process. Uh, process. Uh, but it does have its advantages. I mean, it, social media uh, allows us to connect with our community and view tons of content that relates to our interests, and we can explore all kinds of new ideas. It can be extremely inspiring, but it can also be very overwhelming and draining and a big waste of time. You really have to use it wisely. I mean, really, how seriously do you value your time? Are you know, are you using it for inspiration, um, or are you putting off more important things you should be working on? You know, we're taught that uh, to think uh, that uh, having a lot of choices is a good thing, but there's, you know, there's something called information information overload. You know. Uh, there can just be too much, too much information. I think some people call that decision fatigue. Um, uh, That's why, you know, it's hard to make decisions uh, like at the end of the day after a long, hard work day when your mind is overloaded and tired. I mean, and then you put, uh, you're overloaded and tired and then you go home and start staring at social media and then that's even more draining. I think it's just, I think it's, really uh, can be actually confusing to people. You have all these new trends and all these things happening and people putting out tons of promotional material and it can make some people feel like, wow, everybody's so fabulous except me. You know, <laughs> It's like when they're doing all these fabulous things and they're so fabulous and their costumes are fabulous and their videos are fabulous and um, so it, it can be kind of confusing. It can be overwhelming. It can be, um, it can cause people to feel like, I don't know which, what to do. Am I supposed to look like that? Is that the way I'm supposed to be dancing? Um, is that the costume I should be wearing? Is that, it's too much. I think you, it really can be confusing. Um, I think it's just a difference in people and how you use it. Mm -hmm. I definitely know that, and it depends on the day and how I engage, but one thing that I've noticed, especially on Facebook, is that sometimes, pretty often, you know, I log on, and then when I log off, I'm less happy than when I logged on. And I know some of that is uh, related to some of what you mentioned, which is, you know, social media encourages us. And I I wish I knew who to quote on this, but they said um, it encourages you to compare your insides to other people's outsides. Yeah. And an awful lot of it is just so many things going by and it's this person complaining about this and this thing I feel like I need to do and this thing that I feel like I'm not doing well enough. Um, And do you have any tips for engaging in a way that, make sure that it stays constructive? You know, that is really um, kind of difficult. You can, you you know, you can really, um, we have more control over what we're looking at on social media than we think, you know. If there's something that you really um, don't want to see, you, you know, you can definitely unfollow that, that person or, you know, you can you can start filtering, you know, what you're looking at. But it, it does get really difficult because once you go down that rabbit hole, all this stuff starts coming up and people are sharing things and it's like it's, it's very overwhelming sometimes. And it can make you um, feel like you're just not doing enough. And, um, and the danger of comparing yourself to other people is, really um, big on social media, as you were just saying. That is really a dangerous thing. You don't want to compare yourself to other people. You know, we, I think we start to lose sight about how unique um, each and every one of us really is. And I think when I got into belly dance, 
um, I loved that about it. Everybody was so unique and you strived to be unique. You didn't copy people. I mean, everybody, is, as a student, you emulate your teachers and you study the masters and you uh, go through that process of emulating maybe as, you're, as a student, and that's part of a learning process. I'm not talking about that, but the, we were encouraged to be unique. We made our own costumes to be unique. We developed our own styles to be unique. It, it, that... Um, but with social media, I find uh, so many people are starting to copy people because they think that's how they need to be. And um, I, th- I find that very sad. I, 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 I think people are losing sight. They don't, they're afraid to be their self. They're afraid to be true to their self. And I, uh, you know, there was a time you never copied a dancer. You, that was just, not, that was unheard of. You just didn't do it. Um, and now it seems to be normal. With the YouTube sensation especially, people are starting to emulate, you know, famous, famous dancers. Um, and I can understand that, you know, in a learning process for 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 uh, new dancers, but um, I, I just find uh, that's just really sad. I, I I would like to start seeing people become, you know, really strive to be unique and and celebrate who they are as a dancer and work hard on themselves and not feel that they have to compare themselves to anyone. Um, It's great to admire people because you get great inspiration from people that you uh, admire and be inspired by them and learn from them, but um, be yourself and be happy about being yourself. Um, Yeah, so that's that's a big thing with social media. I, I think the, the the dangers of comparing yourself to others is is that's not a good thing. Mm-hmm. It can that in itself can be inspiring. You can say, you know, I really, you know, I'm going to really work on myself and get in better shape. You know, be inspired by it. Don't uh, compare yourself. Mm-hmm. Be entertained by it. Don't compare yourself. Be yourself. And be the best you can be. Now, one thing that, you know, we've talked about both on your previous visit uh, to the show and also when I met you in California a while back um, was perfectionism. Um, Can you talk about how that plays into creative blocks? Oh, perfectionism is a big contributor to create a block. That's one of my biggest blocks. <laughs> um, that's when you really get stuck in your own head. Um, you know, when you think everything has to be perfect and you're not satisfied with anything you're, that you're putting out or it, it just has to be bigger and better than the last thing that you did, you're really getting in your own way um, of being creative. Art isn't perfect anyway. It, art is art. I think it was Tony Robbins said, rather than thinking of uh, striving for perfection, why not strive for excellence? Uh, excellence is, is, that's achievable, and that's enough pressure in itself. But trying to be perfect is, it's really, it, it's, there's no such thing. And I've I've kind of convinced myself there that that's I can strive for excellence, but perfection no that's I don't want to be perfect. An artist is constantly uh, a work in progress, and um, all the art that we put out there is constantly a work in pro- progress. We are constantly changing and growing, and 
uh, my ideas yesterday aren't the same as they are today. Uh, and they, I'll probably change my mind tomorrow. So be happy with that and be okay with, with uh, the, the creative process. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can strive for excellence, but perfection isn't attainable. I mean, that's, it's impossible to be perfect. Mm-hmm. So you have to take pressure off yourself and try to get out of your head. Mm-hmm. So one thing that slowed me down with perfectionism is I didn't realize I had it. Um, one of the, I, I almost like to joke about it. It's, um, you know, I didn't think I could be a perfectionist because I had a messy room. Um, right. so, and, and I feel like, uh, particularly in the belly dance world, um, there is this kind of vein of folks who really want to do the right thing. You know, the, the really conscientious students, the folks who, you know, really want to be respectful and it, that translates into mm-hmm. having to be right or having to find the right way. And I think sometimes we don't identify things like that as perfectionism. Um, do you have any tips for folks on how to tell if they might be affected by perfectionism, if it doesn't, even if the word perfect doesn't uh, jump out at them? Yes, there's, yeah, as you say, there's different kinds of perfectionism because I'm the same way. I can have a very messy desk, but at the same time, I'm a perfectionist. And I like everything being just so um, in, uh, you know, my in my dance, in my classes, and the way I teach. Uh, I think it's it, that comes out in different ways, and that can come out as um, perfectionism can come out in a way that when you feel that you have mastered something, you can get stuck in that uh, box of thinking that's the only way and the right way to do things. And you've, um, I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but, um, or uh, if I'm getting my point across, but you can put yourself in a box, whether it's doing the right thing or in trying to be a certain way uh, in the community or conducting things a certain way and thinking that that's the only way and the right way then you really are putting yourself in a box. Uh, that's when you start getting into your own head and you create mental blocks um, about starting to see things in a different way or be creative and branch out a little bit and have some, um, uh, you have to have some room for, for, for uh, to see other points of view because there isn't just one way to do things. There's many schools of thought in, in dance and, and, and in even the way you uh, run a business. So um, perfectionism can actually uh, keep you from being perfect. <laughs> it can really... Um, I think you you can get into some kind of narrow thought process where you're not seeing things in different ways. And uh, that is a big contributor to create a block. You have to be able to see things from other points of view in order to uh, be a creative person. You don't have to do it that other person's way, uh, but you have to open your mind to other things and see that other things work just as well. Did I did I make any sense? Absolutely. Uh, and I also wanted to circle back. Um, you know, one of the things that you've mentioned a couple times so far is the baggage that we carry with us into our creative life. Um, are there any particular types of baggage or types of experiences that we have that create baggage that we should start digging into or any, you know, internal monologues that we should be aware aren't really healthy or helpful? Yes, I think you have to evaluate or start digging and asking yourself, what are you missing or what are you lacking? Um, and what are you, what are your 
abundances. So uh, what's really going on in your life? Are there, uh, if there's too many things on your to-do list that, you, uh, that are weighing on your mind, how are you supposed to be creative? If you have too many personal problems in your life, how are you supposed to be creative? You have to evaluate what you're lacking and what you have too much of. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, is it a lack of time, uh, a lack of energy, a, a lack of inspiration? It could be um, a lack of confidence, um, lack of support from the people around you. Um, maybe it's a lack of communication uh, with your dance troupe or your maybe your family. Uh, maybe you're not communicating the kind of me time uh, you need uh, in your dancing. Maybe with your, if it's a dance troupe, you're, uh, there's some kind of uh, communication that's, that's, you know, a lack of communication that's going on. Uh, maybe you're feeling a lack of uh, appreciation. Maybe it's a lack of knowledge. Maybe you need to get to some more workshops, take some, get back to classes. There's, ask yourself, what are you missing? What are you lacking? And I hope all those things aren't going on at the same time, but um, sometimes it's just a lack of confidence even or just um, uh, a lack of believing in yourself. Um, uh, or maybe you in and what do you have too much of? Uh, too much responsibility. You're wearing too many hats. Uh, maybe you need to start delegating some some of these responsibilities. Too much stress. Too many personal problems. Some people have too much time time on their hands, and they they just have poor time management. It could be what we were talking about before. It could be information overload or decision fatigue. I mean, um, maybe it's just confusion. You just there's too much. There's too much, and you just have you don't know what which direction to go in. Maybe too much criticism from the people around you. Who are the people around you? Where is your support network? You know, it's it's you have to start. Saying what? What am I missing here? What? What am I? What are my needs? And what are, we think of abundance as being a good thing, but sometimes we have too much of too many things that are aren't so good. And uh, you have to start digging deep and start chipping away at some of the the baggage in your life. How can you be a creative person? Uh, it's I, I just don't know how you can. I mean, some people work great under pressure. I think that's just a difference in people. Uh, a lot of people don't. A lot of people, their dancing and, and being creative is an escape for a lot of their problems. Maybe you have to turn things around and look at it differently and start using some of your baggage to be creative. Some people do turn it around and, and find a way to uh, use adversity uh, in a creative way. If you had to come up really fast with uh, uh, be create really creative, uh, let's say you don't have money for your rent and you have to get creative all of a sudden, you're going to get real creative and figure out how to make some money so you can pay your rent. So maybe adversity can make you creative. You have to decide what you're going to do with that baggage. If you need to clear it away, you need to start chipping away at it. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't find having any kind of, uh, when things are weighing on my mind, I can't, I have to take care of it. If I have some endless to-do list, I have to take care of things and then I can be creative. I have to free my mind. So I, I think it's very different uh, for everyone. And everybody's life is very different and their situation is very different. And um, I really think that people around us, uh, talking 
uh, again, about some extor- external forces, really play a big part in uh, our creative process. It's really hard when you don't have a good support system. And um, that's really difficult. So um, so what's, what is the situation? Maybe sometimes you just have to back off for a little while and take care of some things and then come back to it with, uh, come back to your uh, dance with a, a fresh perspective, with a clear mind. Um, you got to find what works for you. And, and, you know, take care of it. I mean, we, if you love your dancing and you love being creative, nurture that. And and get things get it, get it out of the way. I mean, creative blocks mean that something is literally blocking us and blocking your mind. It's something is in your way. That's why they call it a block. Somebody is something is uh, blocking uh, blocking you from um, inspiration. And inspiration is all around us. So you just ha- you have to look for it. You have to want to look for it, and you have to be open. That's the thing. You have to be open to it. Now you mentioned the need to nurture your creativity. Are there any specific practices that you recommend for that? A lot of uh, a lot of um, people will tell you you need to do. Um, I think it's really different for everybody. Uh, I think the common answer is uh, to uh, not only practice your your art, but try to find other creative outlets that take you away from your main art form uh, so your mind uh, can free itself. It's like that mental block of, of just being so much in your head with one thing that um, you can't start thinking differently. Other creative outlets are very helpful, whether it's painting or... Some people just find jogging or taking a walk. It can clear their mind. It's just some other activity that can take you away from... um, your art for a moment, just so you can think clearly. Um, Different kinds of music that you don't normally listen to. Um, There's all kinds of different ways people try to nurture their creativity. I think, uh, and then some people will tell you, well, I don't have time for that. I I have barely enough time to do what I'm doing. And I get that because everybody doesn't have time to go take a yoga class or take a, a a different kind of dance class or um, they're doing everything they can to do what they have to do uh, already. So how do you step back? Sometimes you just have to step back from it because you can get too close to it and you can't see a different way of doing things or a new way of doing things. And uh, if there's any way you can step back from it sometimes, it it can be very helpful or do something completely different. I've gotten stuck uh, while I'm choreographing and sometimes I'll just uh, beat it to death and I just think, why am I just so blocked? And, And I'll just go take a walk. I'll just do something completely different. I'll go... uh uh, just do anything else, and I can come back to it with a fresh approach. You have to almost sometimes just get out of your own head and just walk away, and you have to know the difference between just procrastinating and just going off and doing something else because you don't want to do the work. You have to do the work, you know. You have to commit to it. That's another thing about creativity. Sometimes it's just hard work and you have to show up and you have to do it and you have to stare at yourself in the mirror until you you start getting ideas. You just have to. 
you you just it, it's very hard work and it takes effort I work very very hard sometimes it's easy and things just come to me and sometimes I just have to get in the studio or my little home studio here and just work and just I don't I won't let myself out of the room <laughs> for a certain amount of time like you have to do this and stand and just be here. And if you really can't do something within a certain amount of time, then okay, I'll go take a take a walk, go get a cup of coffee, whatever it may be. But you you really do if you've gone through um, and uh, really dug deep and thought, no, I'm I'm doing pretty good, everything's good, and I I think I um, I don't have any you know big personal problems or too many things weighing on my mind right now. I just need to buckle down and do it. Then just do it because it's hard work. Being creative and being an artist is hard sometimes. And it's it just takes a lot of effort. But the biggest thing that I think that I've had to remember and uh, is um, I at different times have learned I had to learn to fall in love with the dance again. I don't mean I necessarily fell out of love with it. It's something I've always loved, and I don't get tired of it. I, I it's something, it's a part of me. I found that at one time, I, I uh, think I lost the magic that you feel when you first start dancing or first start when you first get into the dance everything is just magical and amazing and I thought how do I get that back that was amazing I was constantly inspired and it it was just magic and I had to dig deep about that when your dancing becomes a job. It's a job. It's a job you love. And I'm extremely fortunate to to have danced all these years. Um, but it's, it, it is a job and it's hard work and there's responsibility and, and all those things that go with a business, a dance business. Um, and... I had to find the love again. I mean, there's a magic. I'll call it magic. And um, that was, um, I had to change the way I looked at it. I had to look at it again with maybe um, more childlike eyes. And I remembered um, seeing my very first teacher when I saw her for the very first time. She was wearing all gold and white, and I just thought she was an angel. I just, I, I have goosebumps right now. Just thinking about it, I have goosebumps. And I was just in awe. And I just thought, that was just totally magic. And you have to realize, people see you and they see magic. And um, I, I teach children also, and they just are in awe of everything. And I, I, I had to capture that magic again. And that's what uh, I love. I, I, I do. I have captured it, and I do remind myself how magical the dance is. And um, we're so lucky to do it. And that's where Jeannie comes from. So I know you're going to ask me that at some point, but I, I'll, I'll wait till you're ready. I do want to ask you about that, but how did you reconnect with that magic? That, it, it, it's not easy. And I had, first of all, I had to recognize it. And I thought, why don't I have that, 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 
love, that magical feeling anymore? Do I just take it for granted? Uh, is it just become part of, it has, it has become part of my everyday life. Um, and I, I think you have to, um, I allowed myself to start having fun again. And I decided to create um, dances and um, for my students that I felt were really fun and kind of magical and maybe a little more theatrical than they usually do. And I, 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 I really kind of saw how excited my students get. You know, I, I just love to, to feed off the excitement of my students. And I thought, why am I feeding off of them? Why don't I feel that way? And I started to just do what I love. I didn't realize I fall into the trap of of everyday business and all the administrative work and answering emails and all the things you do, class planning and playlists and all the things that we do that take up a lot of time. And I thought I I forget to just play. Just play. Dance is fun. It's amazing. I mean, it's it's just the most amazing thing to be able to dance. Um, and um, I think it's about seeing it as playing. I'm starting to play again. I play with my jewelry. I play with my costume. I'm starting to play again. and And I'm making it fun. And uh, I guess it just became so much of a, a, an everyday thing for me and um, a lot of work. And I certainly have always loved it, but it was a job. And, I, you know, there's pressure. You have to come up with new things and you have to always be, you know, coming up with uh, new class plans and things like that. And I, now it's, I, I play. It's it's dance is playtime to me. I make it playtime. I have to do all the business stuff too, but the dance part is now playing for me. I don't know if that makes sense. Does <laughs> it does absolutely. All right. Um. And so let's go ahead and circle back to the genie concept. Can you tell us about what that is and how we can use it? Yes, well, Jeannie is a uh, part of my playtime concept. Um, but I was thinking as I was uh, along the way about uh, the creative blocks, going back to the creative blocks and finding um, how to find your creative genius. And then I thought, well, what is a genius anyway? And um, when I was reading about uh, the origins of a genius, um, I, I found out that in ancient Roman religion, the genius was a separate divine being uh, of, of nature that was uh, present in every person, place, and thing. And um, so uh, an artist wasn't a genius himself or herself, but rather he or she possessed a genius. And this genius uh, played a big role in helping them create their art. Um, so even inanimate objects had this uh, mag magical gin, or what I like to call genie, attached to them. So if something went wrong and uh, something wasn't um, working, that person's uh, genie was out to lunch that day. So it wasn't really until like the Renaissance period that the ego of the artist took over and then the artist began to be thought of as a genius rather than possessing a genius. So I thought, wow, that's a really great way to start thinking of creativity 
rather than putting all that pressure on yourself and thinking that you're like this sole source of creativity, um, you really have to start looking outward for inspiration and start seeing it as uh, this outward inspiration as a magical entity. And, um, And that could be very different for each person, but the idea is to keep growing and searching for fresh and new ideas and, and, and see that as it, it's just a new magical adventure. That's why so many artists throughout history have had a muse. Uh, we, we can't do it all ourselves. There has to be outside inspiration. You can't think, if you start to think that you're just this sole source of creativity, that it's just coming out of your, it's really kind of conceited, really. I mean, uh, that's where we get stuck in our own heads. Is You have to start looking outside yourself. I mean, we have to do the work and we, you have to work hard as a dancer or any kind of artist. But where's your genie? Where's your magic? You know, you, you, I think that's, that's who, who the, uh, my genie in the bottle is. You've got to let that genie out of the bottle and let the genie work for you. So that's my story of genie <laughs> or muse. I mean, that, that can be different for everybody. I mean, I don't really think there's really, like, I don't talk to a invisible, you know, magical fantasy person, but I... I just try to look outside myself and get out of my own head. you got to get out of your own way. Because I think that's the biggest block. We get in our own way. And uh, you just got to stop it. Sometimes you just have to back off, do something different for a while, and come back and, and try to find your genie and not take yourself so seriously. I take what I do very seriously. I don't necessarily take myself seriously. I think that's when I started finding a lot more magic again in the dance. I, I, you have to laugh at yourself sometimes and, and just get out of your own head. I think it helps. Everybody has their own method. And, and maybe that people can find their own way or find the muse. I mean, it doesn't have to be a person. Sometimes it's just uh, if you maybe you see it as a, a muse. Um, but you can't, it can't be all you. That's not how it works. There's constant inspiration. I mean, um, even famous uh, painters of uh, travel to different cultures just to get out of their own head and start thinking differently and and start creating new work and, and stop thinking the same way. You you have to, um, as I call it, get out of your own head, get out of your own way. And do you have any tips for you know, in, inviting your genie in and the care and feeding of genies? <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing. I, I really think, I think the way you let inspiration in, first of all, as we talked about, start getting rid of some baggage. Start asking yourself some questions. What are you lacking? What do you have too much of? What's getting in your way? What's making you unhappy? How can you free your mind? You've got to free up your mind as best you can. You've got to keep an open mind, too, and you can't be afraid of trying new things. I think we get afraid that we can't get out of that box. And you have to try every new trend that comes along. First of all, you've got to be true to yourself. I mean, we've we got to stay true to ourselves. And you don't have to do things just because everybody else is doing it or just because it's a new thing. It has to be inspiring. But don't be afraid to try something if you like it. Um, 
And you got to try to always remember what it was that drew you into the dance in the first place, the magic you felt. It really is still there. You just have to look for it. But I think you have to do some really, a lot of soul searching. And um, I think it's, it's, don't be afraid to do other things that, you know, do something that you're bad at once in a while. Take a different kind of class that you've never taken before and just be bad at something, you know? And that kind of puts things into perspective. You start to remember what it was like when you were just a beginner dancer and just that that process, that new that process, and look at where you came. Look how far you've come. Look how hard you've worked. I mean, it's it's creativity is all around us. I think you just need to um Sometimes we really have to feed Jeannie. You got to feed the Jeannie. You got to just give Jeannie new material. Uh, you've got to give her uh, the new material. You have to do new things and start looking outward. Um, you know, even if you don't have a lot of time, I mean, um, try, you know, some new music that you've never used before. Come up with some new things. Just just try it. Don't be afraid. Feed your genie something new. Wear a new color you've never worn before. You've always been afraid to wear <laughs> the hot pink. Come on, try it, you know? Whatever whatever just kind of gives you a little bit of a thrill. Just just you know. That's very different for everybody. Everybody feels differently. And everything, different things work for different people. Um, maybe it's just a different fitness program. You have to start cross-training. Get out, just get out of, you know, get away from dance, you know, a couple hours a week or uh, do something just completely different. Move differently. You know, movement, a different kind of movement. It doesn't even have to be a different kind of dance. Um, sometimes just um, spark something different because you're, you're using different uh, and developing different muscle memory. It, it just maybe it, it, not that you're going to use that different movement necessarily in your dancing, but it, different kinds of movement I think it, it does something to your brain too. You you just start thinking differently about different kind of ways of moving and that can be very helpful because you're you're getting away from the, the, the standard movement that you're always used to doing in oriental dance um, and I'm not suggesting that you start doing fusion or anything like that it's up to you but um, uh, it's just about doing something different that can be extremely inspiring <clears throat> only because you're thinking of something new and you're moving in a new way and you're, you're uh, doing something new with your brain, uh, different artistically with your brain if you decide to doodle. You know, you, you don't have to go to a painting class. Get some paper and start doodling and, and just come up with or journaling. Start coming up with uh, just different ways of, of just getting ideas out. There's so many different ways to be creative and just get that thought process going. All right, so, so far we've been talking about uh, kind of nurturing your own creativity, but one thing that we touched on a little bit was that there are some things that are outside of ourselves that affect our creativity. So if we think about being a force for good, you know, what, what can we teachers or dancers at large or students do to make the dance world more supportive of creativity? Well, I think, uh, you know, you, uh, as teachers, um, I think we can um, let people know, you know, the, the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize, let people know that you enjoy their events. 
if they're doing a good job and you really enjoy their events or their classes, you, there's teachers that you enjoy their classes, or you like their social media posts, they're inspiring to you, tell them. Say, gee, I really I was inspired by that or I really enjoyed that. You know, because a, a lot of people don't realize, people don't tell people what they enjoy. And there's plenty of... of uh, event sponsors and uh, people they get criticized a lot or they feel like oh nobody appreciates this why am I doing this you know um, tell people what you like and you know don't be fake I mean tell people what you truly like and if you don't like it I mean you don't have to be mean or critical you just don't have to uh, you know uh, follow that person on you know social media or whatever but if you really like something, tell people. Tell them they're doing a good job. That is inspiring to them. They'll keep putting good events out there. They feel appreciated. It just kind of filters down. It just kind of, you know, uh, it helps everybody. You're doing good for everybody. And that's how good work stays out there. If somebody really did a good job, tell them they did a good job. Be a good audience member. Be a, you know, uh, applaud for everybody. Be, be polite. Um, teachers need to instill good community, you know, skills in their students and, and be respectful at dance events and um, be supportive and positive, and, and teachers need to lead by example. I think teachers need to be, um, try to, you know, show enthusiasm to their students and uh, be encouraging, um, you know, encourage people and let people know when they're doing a good job. It's, you know, people don't say enough nice things sometimes. And sometimes people are too fake and they say everybody's fabulous, everything's fabulous, and and then they are catty, you know, uh, behind people's backs. Don't do that. If you really, truly like somebody, tell them and be sincere. If you don't like some, something, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to attend those events or, you know, just be polite at least. Be... be um, courteous. Um, there's no reason to, to be cruel. It just drags everybody down. And um, if somebody, especially uh, social media, let people know when they are posting really inspiring things and you really enjoy it. Uh, and, and that would encourage them to do more of that. And uh, maybe less of uh, all the cute puppy posts and all, you know, all this stuff that we see on social media that I think is adorable, but it's just more stuff that you just have to filter through, um, you know, on your dance pages. It's like you want to see good content and not what everybody had for lunch, you know, or, or just, you know, talking about their fabulous new costume and how fabulous they are. You know, we want to see more inspiring content. And, and I think the more you tell people that and encourage people to post those things, then then that's what you get. And don't like things if you don't like them just because everybody else did. You know, it's 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 you want to be inspired. You want, you know, good quality events. And people will keep uh, doing good quality events if you are supportive and let them know what you like. So I think it's just trying to be, uh, you know, support creativity, support people that are working hard. And um, if you're really, uh, this kind of goes back to the the my first visit on uh, uh, the geek clubhouse, but be positive. You know, it's it's kind of infectious, and um, I think it encourages people to to be more inspiring to others. 
instead of feeling like, oh, everybody's just, nobody appreciates me and, you know, everybody's just critical and, you know, it, it, that's what, what, what happens a lot of times is people don't feel appreciated and people don't feel like they want to put out their work because they feel like they're going to be criticized. You know, our community should be very, very supportive, you know, and encouraging. And I think teachers need to be um, encouraging to their students to put out, to work hard and to do the best job they can and uh, tell them when they're doing a good job and then help them if they need help. And, and uh, you know, when, when people are critical, or if, especially if people are start gossiping in classes, uh, I don't allow it in my classes. I, 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 I just don't allow it. I don't do it. And I don't allow it in my classes. If I, somebody starts talking bad about somebody at another event or criticizing another teacher, I, I, I nip it in the bud right away. I just don't allow it. It's just not. It's it's very un, it's unprofessional to teachers to allow that in classes. If somebody needs to talk to you personally about a problem, they can come to you and talk to you uh, in private. But that's you know you you shouldn't uh, um, let neg- uh, let negative talk happen or people gossiping in classes. That's very bad. It's uninspired. And there are people in the class that feel um, that makes them feel very uncomfortable. They may not say it, but it does make people uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. I don't like it, and it's wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, that starts just a lot of plants a lot of bad seeds in people's heads. I mean, it's just it, it isn't good. Be inspiring to others. And it'll come back to you. Your genie will reward you. (laughs) All right. Well, I'd like to open it up to questions and answers from listeners. Um, Before we do that, if people take one thing away from this call, what would you want that to be? Well, I, I think be true to yourself. With all the information that's out there, you know, on social media and all the new trends and what have you, you have to stay true to who you are and do what makes you happy. I think that's the bottom line. You've got to just make yourself happy. Don't worry about what other people think of you and stop comparing yourself to others. Uh, you know, you you know what you like. You know, you you you're all right. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you you know, we all need to work on things and you know, it's good to be um uh, to question ourselves and, and constantly wanting to improve. But yes, we all do that. We're all a work in progress. But be true to yourself and you know, try new things, try to open your mind, but you don't have to try every trend. You don't have to follow everything that is, that's going on out there. Uh, it's very, it can be very confusing. So that's what I hope people can come away with. Be true to yourself. Great. And if folks want to learn more from you, how can they do that? Uh, you can go to ZahraZuhair.com. That's my website. You can see what I'm up to or... You're welcome to email me uh, at zahra at aol.com or message me on Facebook on uh, Zahra Zuhair Rock Sharky on Facebook. I love hearing from people, so, you know, feel free to uh, contact me or if you're ever in L.A., um, come to one of my classes. I teach every week here in L.A., so um, I hope to hear from some people. Great. All right. So let's go ahead and open this up to questions and answers. So if you have a question for Zahra or if you want to share your favorite takeaway or your favorite story about a creative block or a technique for getting out of it, we would love to hear from you. 
If you are just listening on the webcast and you don't have your mic and speakers connected, you can uh, type that in on the question box on the right hand side. That looks like a square question cartoon bowl with three little dots in it. Or if you're on the phone or Skype, you can press star star to unmute yourself and we would love to hear from you. This is the part where we wait for the first person to be brave and jump in. Uh, right. Nobody ever wants to be first. Hey, I know. All right. So Don typed in a question for us. This is Don Devine, who's uh, also been on the podcast. Hi, Don. Hi, she Don. asks, does Zara have any specific techniques that she teaches students on how to stay open to their genie? Yes, you have to. Um, my specific technique is um, once I I realize that I'm kind of blocked creatively, I I realize that I'm 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 stuck in my own head. And when you get stuck in your own head, <clears throat> that's because you're maybe even doing trying to do things. Um, you're not looking at it from a fresh perspective. You're um, you're doing things in a maybe in a set way, or you've fallen back into some kind of box that worked for you before. So I sometimes I I actually do just walk away. Um, I don't give myself uh, uh, permission to just start procrastinating and doing something else, but sometimes I do just walk away. I make a cup of tea or just eat some fruit, just do something that, I even do something very mundane, like go brush your hair or wash your face and just kind of regroup and say, okay, I got to get out of my own head. And, you know, I need to start thinking differently. I need to, to find Jeannie. And, and I, sometimes that just works. It just, you, you just have to back off. Sometimes you just put yourself into a box and you 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 corner yourself and and you got to back off for a little bit and just walk away for a little bit. But I don't suggest you start doing email or something like that. Don't start doing other <laughs> fairly because then you're you're actually getting into um uh, some other project. I, I usually do something very mundane, like I'll even cook or something. I actually get a lot of ideas when I do something mundane, like do the dishes or something like that. I just put on music and I let my mind wander. Sometimes daydreaming is a great thing. Um, if you start daydreaming, you it, it's it's great. You know, kids daydream a lot. That's why they're cr creative. Um, daydreaming is a great thing. It can it can really kind of take you away from and take you out of your head. You can just start thinking anything. Just let your mind wander a little bit and do something mundane for, for a few minutes or 10, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and just stop thinking about it. It's okay. You just start writing, start journaling, start doodling. It's a great way to just free your mind. Everybody has different methods. Those are some of mine. If I can add a plug for washing dishes, um, my mom is a poet and she keeps a notepad next to the sink because she gets all of her best ideas either uh, in the shower or washing dishes. Yes, it's something about that most mundane task. I have a friend that vacuums. It's mm -hmm. something about that hum of the vacuum and just that it's almost like white noise or something that just clears her mind. And um, it's worked for me sometimes too. I, it's really sometimes something very mundane opens your mind to genie. And you're, because the genie has to get in and you have to be free and you have to get out of your, you have to get out of the way. That's what the problem is. We get in our own way. And, uh, uh, doing dishes really works for me too. It's it's really great. It's it's so mindless that that's exactly what you need. Something mindless, and you need to let your mind just wander, 
And that's when ideas can come in. Their genial just, boom, will come right in. All right. Well, thanks, Don. That was a great question. If you have more, we would love to hear from you. So you can go ahead and type those in. And if any of you else would like to ask a question, you can type them in on the right or press star star to unmute yourself. Okay, it looks like that might be it. Last call. Also running a little low on power on my laptop here, so I may just call it right here. Uh, well, thank you so much, Zahra. Thank you. I enjoyed it so much, as always. It was great to have you back, and you said so many things that I needed to hear. Oh, great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I'd also like to uh, thank everybody for coming. This is the end of our call, but that doesn't mean that the conversation has to end. We've got a private Facebook group just for Clubhouse folks, and that is limited to dancers only. So um, when you ask to join, there will be a slight delay between when you request it and when I approve you. Um, I'll include a link to that group when I have this call. Um, we'll also have a link to our feedback survey. So if you have any topics or speakers or improvements that you'd like to hear uh, on the clubhouse. We would love to find out. And up to your calendar, our next call is coming up on June 24th, and we are going to be welcoming back Sahra Kent. And the last thing that I want to say is that this is the come on in kind of clubhouse, not the no boys allowed kind. So if you know anybody who would like to join us, you can invite them to at bellydancegeek.com slash clubhouse. And until next time, happy dancing. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks for listening. For more Geektacular resources, visit bellydancegeek.com.